you may be seated. I so appreciate the songs that were picked this morning. That, that second song that I don't need to be heard. I need God to speak. You know, um, we didn't come here to hear any eloquent sermon. If you did, then, well, I don't, I'll try not to disappoint, I suppose, but no pressure or anything. Um, but that's not why we're here, right? We're not here to hear a world-class speaker or see a great grand production and light show. We're here to hear the Word of God speak. Thank you. I give honor to my pastor. Pastor and his wife and his family are on vacation today. Um, a well-deserved vacation. All the work they do continually for this church. Uh, I give honor to them. And uh, it's always humbling to be here. And I appreciate the opportunity. Um, welcome on a snowy Minnesota morning. All who braved the cold and the snow this morning. If you didn't brave it and you're home online and wrapped in a blanket or uh, sitting on a heating pad or whatever else the case may be, <laughs> sipping cocoa, then, then welcome. We're so glad you joined us. Um, today we are continuing our series on a time to rebuild using Ezra's blueprint. And today we're continuing it by talking about rebuilding on the foundation of the Word of God, of the Bible. How many people brought their Bibles this morning? How many people have their Bibles on their phone? That technically counts. I'm partial to an actual, you know, book because I just happen to like books, but it still counts to have it on your phone. So we're going to start today by talking about a construction project. 139 years ago, on the 19th of March, 1882, construction began on the Sagrada Familia, the Church of the Holy Family in Barcelona, Spain. And the images you're seeing are of that church in Barcelona. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's amazing. It's an amazing work of art. After only a year of work, however, the original architect resigned, and the Catalan architect Antoni Gaudi took control of the project. He immediately began engineering a new type of structure, which combined Gothic and Art Nouveau designs into what would become one of the most unique and visited churches in the world. His design called for a church shaped in the classic Latin cross of most cathedrals, but that's where the familiarities end. The church was to be the tallest in the world at 172 and a half meters, conspicuously just short of the tallest hill in Barcelona, as Gaudi thought that his creation should not be higher than God's. It was to have 18 spires, 12 for the apostles, one for Mary, four for the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and one for Jesus Christ. Each would be filled with tubular bells topped by sculptures. It was to have three grand facades representing the nativity, the passion, and the glory. The interior columns would rise as much as 60 meters from the floor into branching geometric patterns intended to recall great trees. Throughout the interior, there are essentially no broad, flat surfaces, and everywhere in the design of the church, there would be no exact right angles. Gaudi preferred to draw inspiration from the flowing, organic shapes of nature. The Basilica de la Sagrada Familia is an incredible achievement, but the most incredible thing about it is not its architecture, it's not its engineering or its design. It's the fact that it's not finished. It's still very much under construction 139 years after ground was broken. Gaudi made the church his life's work, but in 1926, he died. It is estimated that at the time, the work was only about 25% complete. But the work didn't stop. 
It slowly continued until in 1936, it was interrupted by the Spanish Civil War. Revolutionaries broke into the church and damaged parts of the crypt and destroyed architectural models. And since then, work has progressed slowly, relying mostly on private donations to continue. And it was not until the 21st century, with the advent of computer imaging, that construction sped up considerably and reached the halfway point, halfway, 50%, in 2010. They were halfway done in 2010. It's going slow. As of right now, it is estimated that construction will continue until 2032. This means that construction of the Sagrada Familia will have taken 150 years. And yet, the vision of Antoni Gaudi will not have changed. Since 1882, the church has seen countless workers, engineers, designers, artists, and architects, but Gaudi's vision was never altered. Despite his death 95 years ago, his designs were not lost. His vision was not altered. It begs the question, how is that even possible? How is it possible to look at the designs in the church and know that we are seeing the exact vision of someone who has been dead for almost a century? And it's due to the fact that for 139 years, every worker, every designer, every architect has been following the same models, plans, and blueprints. The blueprints of the Sagrada Familia were established long ago, and they have not been altered. For 139 years, people have been faithfully executing plans that were drawn up even before they were born. Times changed. The world was thrown into war twice. Governments rose and fell. A technological revolution shook the world. People lived and died, and the work continued. Unbothered by the world changing around it, the work continued. And the spires rose into the sky in exact accordance to the designer's blueprints. This takes us to another construction project. Long, long before the Sagrada Familia, the people of Israel were in exile. The first temple, Solomon's temple, had been completely destroyed by the second Babylonian Empire. Its destruction occurred near the end of a nearly 20-year period in which thousands of men, women, and children were periodically taken as captives to Babylon. These captives lived in Babylon for at least 42 years for the most recent captives until Cyrus the Great, founder of the Achaemenid Empire, decreed that they should go home and rebuild their temple. And it's likely that this was an entirely political move, right? It's certain that he did not have faith in God. But he was a king. And as a king, Cyrus understood the power that religion had over the lives of his subjects. And so in setting himself up as the patron of a religion, as the person who's financing religious practices, his intention was likely to set himself in a position of control over his subjects. But despite these evil designs, I'm thankful that our God can use anything, even evil designs, to work towards his own perfect will. And in this case, the Jewish people started returning to Jerusalem. But when they arrived, they found a city in ruins. Piles of rubble, burnt out skeletons of buildings. Little trace of the city walls or the grandeur of Solomon's temple. And a small population of people who had long ago intermarried with the pagan nations surrounding them. And yet, they started work on their temple. Now, think about that. 
there are few people left alive who had ever seen the first temple. Right? Essentially, all trace of it had been wiped away. How did they know what they were building? Right? If we left church today and didn't come back for 42 years, hopefully you come back next week, <laughs> but if you decided to not come back for 42 years, for whatever reason, and when you came back, all that was left was a hole in the ground. This building was gone. How many of us could band together and decide, we're going to build this building exactly how it was? How successful would we be? Right? It would at least be difficult. You know, maybe Mike could do it, or Brandon could do it. I sure couldn't do it. You know, no one's asking me to build anything. You know, I can't build a treehouse or a bird feeder, let alone a building. We all have different gifts, and that's okay. So how did they do it? Right? How did they do it? How did they begin construction on a second temple when so few had ever seen the first? And scripture tells us how they did it. In Ezra chapter 3, verse 2. Then arose Yeshua the son of Yazadak with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel with his kinsmen. Those powerful Hebrew names. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. As it is written. Skipping down to verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. According to the directions of David. So how did they know what they were doing? The short answer is they had a blueprint. Centuries before, maybe as many as a thousand years before, God had given Moses that blueprint. Exact directions were written down as to the dimensions and design of the house of God. Clear, clear instructions were given as to how and when and why sacrifices should be offered to God Almighty. What should the temple look like? How should we sacrifice? How should we worship? What does it mean to be a child of Israel and a faithful follower of the one and the only God. All of their questions were answered long ago by their designer when he drew up the blueprints, when the law was written. These blueprints were not secret. They were not hidden. Anyone could learn about them. Anyone could choose to return to Jerusalem and follow the ancient blueprints in rebuilding the temple. And today, right now, we find ourselves in the middle of yet another construction project. We are building our lives brick upon brick and day upon day. The Lord Jesus is building his church year upon year and soul upon soul. And in the building of our lives and in the building of his church, we have a choice. Will we follow the blueprints of our designer? Or will we build as we see fit? Will we lay the lines of the foundation straight and true as the blueprints demand? Or will we get creative and do what we think is best? Will we follow the Word of God, the Bible, or will we ignore it? Jesus gave us a parable to visualize these differences in construction. In Matthew 7, 24 to 27, he told his disciples this story. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it didn't fall 
because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. So think of the picture that Jesus is painting here. There's these two guys. They seem to live pretty similar lives. They both build houses. For all intents and purposes, they must have been identical houses. Both houses are confronted with a great storm. If you've ever been inside a house, when there's a great storm outside, when there's a good old Minnesota blizzard outside, it's a little scary, right? The whole house starts shaking, the winds are gusting, the windows and doors are rattling, you're just waiting for something to blow in and break somewhere. Please, I hope insurance covers this. Right. It's scary. It's scary. However, one of those houses survived the storm without a scratch. The other crumbled into rubble. And Jesus is relating how the first built their house on a rock, on a cement slab, the way you're supposed to build a house. Right? Right, Mike? Is that right? We're supposed to build houses on cement slabs or something of the like. Well, the second just built their house on the sand, which doesn't seem like a good idea. Just went out to the beach one day. Man, this is such a beautiful view. I should just build a house right here. Right? Why not? Anyone who's ever built a sand castle probably knows the problem with that. Right? Eventually, the water comes in. And the sand fails. Jesus is saying that our lives are the exact same way. You can build your life on the rock, on the teachings and the words of Jesus, and find success. Or you can build your life on sand, on your own opinions and feelings, and discover failure. Some people will misinterpret those words. And they'll say, well, we then, that means we should go through the Bible with our highlighter and highlight all the words of Jesus. And if Jesus said it, then I believe it, and that's it. So that means if he didn't say it, then it's fine. Right? Jesus never specifically said that I shouldn't speed. Right? So going 90 miles an hour in a residential is totally fine. And anyone who knows me knows I have a horrible lead foot, and that speaks to me personally. Right? He never said that. He never said, hey, don't speed. Right? Jesus never specifically said, hey, you shouldn't do drugs. He didn't. You can look backwards and forwards. He never said that. Right? So, doing drugs is fine. Doing drugs is not fine. Kids, don't do drugs. <laughs> but he never said that. Right? It doesn't take a biblical scholar to poke holes in that doctrine. Paul had this to say on the subject, because this was a teaching early in the church. They were following specific words from specific people. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul wrote to his student Timothy, all Scripture, all Scripture, all of it, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. All of it, the Bible, the entirety of it, all of it, this whole thing, there's 66 books in here, it's big. All of it is breathed out by God. It is the literal word of God, the words of Jesus. And you and I have been given a choice today by Jesus Christ himself. Will you build your life on the Word of God, on the Bible? Or will you build your life on your own whims and desires? Will you lay a foundation the exact length and breadth and depth prescribed by the architect of the universe? Or will you do as you see fit? Will you follow the blueprint given to you by your designer who formed you and knew you before you even took breath? Or will you go your own way? I am so thankful.
to be a part of a church, to be under a pastor who believes that the Word of God should be our foundation. That the ancient blueprints should not be deviated from, but they should be studied carefully and followed. This takes us back to Ezra. Ezra was given this task to study. And Ezra is an interesting biblical character because even though he's a prominent figure in the construction of the second temple, he's probably not someone you would have noticed in a crowd. If he was sitting here among us, we probably wouldn't even notice him. We would never point him out. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a judge. He wasn't a warrior or a musician. He wasn't a king or a leader of any kind. He was a Levite, a priest, a scribe. Ezra was a nerd. I mean, the shoe fits. I mean, he was. He was a nerd. It's true. All the best people are, though. It's true. As a nerd, I can just say that confidently. All the best people are nerds. But pay attention to what Ezra did, because he did something really incredible. In Ezra 7, verse 10, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. Not just read it, study it. And to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Ezra was a unique and a motivated person. He took it upon himself to study the Word of God, to do and complete the things he found there, and to teach it to the Jewish people returning to Jerusalem. Ezra committed to understanding the blueprints of God and to bring them back to Jerusalem so that when the foundations of the temple were laid, when the structure went up, and the second temple was finally built, it was built exactly how God wanted it to be done. If we are to lay the foundations of our lives and of this church exactly how God wants them laid, right? this is what this whole series is about, right? Rebuilding, laying our foundation. We need to do exactly what Ezra did. We need to study and do and teach the Word. And that's pretty elementary, right? I know that. I get it. It is. It's simple. Not super complex, right? We're Christians. Turns out that's what Christians do. We read the Bible, we do what it says. That's the whole deal right? That's everything we do. So if you were expecting something different, sorry, that's what we do, right? That's it. But, but bear with me just for a few minutes because we have to get this. This is important. It's simple, but so many of the most important things in life are simple. They really are. There are millions and even billions of people across this earth that don't get this. Millions of people who profess to be Christians, and they don't do this. This needs to be drilled down into the very foundation of our lives, of our church, of who we are. Otherwise, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. Our God has openly and freely given to us his blueprints. But if we can't be bothered to look at them, how can we expect him to be pleased? How can we expect him to usher us into his perfect kingdom? So we need to study and do and teach. And I'm going to quickly cover each of these points. We're going to start off with study. We need to study the Word of God. It is imperative that we study the Bible, that we study it daily. On one of their missionary journeys, Paul and Silas came to a small Greek city, Berea. And this is the reaction the people there had to their teaching in Acts 17 and verse 11. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. 
They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. One of the greatest hang-ups and hindrances, I am convinced, to our completing God's will for our lives, one of the things that impedes the light of truth to penetrate throughout the Christian world is a human tendency that we all have that just comes naturally to just take somebody's word for it. Someone told me that it's okay if I live my life a certain way because God wants me to be happy. And we just take their word for it. Without ever consulting God's opinion on the matter. What does the word of God say? Right? What does Jesus have to say? These Jews in Acts didn't do that. They heard what Paul and Silas had to say. They listened, and they thought it sounded pretty good. But then they turned to Scripture. Right? I like what you have to say. It makes a whole lot of sense. It sounds good. But what does God have to say about it? Do your words agree with the words of God? And that's the key. That's the key. We need to study this word and learn God's blueprint for ourselves. And that doesn't mean that you stop listening to the word being preached. Right? That doesn't mean that you ignore spiritual authorities in your life. I thank God for spiritual authorities in my life. They're willing to challenge me and speak truth into my life. What it means is that you recognize that no word of any human being will ever, can never, supersede the word of the living God. And we need to know this. Because if we don't, we will fall. We will succumb to the lies of this world and we will die. Hosea prophesied a curse over those who would remain ignorant of the word of God. In Hosea 4, 6, my people, my people, the people of Israel, God's chosen people, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. That's terrifying. Right? It's heavy. We need to be knowledgeable on the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. All of it. I know it's a lot. It's a big book, it turns out. All of it, cover to cover. The number of professing Christians that I have met who are ignorant of basic Bible stories is staggering. We need to know our Bible because our doctrine cannot be limited to a few happy, feel-good verses that we've memorized. It can't be. I know that's heavy, and I know that's hard, but it can't be, because there is so much more. When you're building a house, Mike, Brandon, when you're building a house, you don't just put up the walls and then call it a day. Oh, we're done. Looks good. No, because that's not a house. That's just a bunch of walls. You lay a foundation, right? You frame it. You roof it. You put in the plumbing and the electrical. You hang drywall. You hang the doors and the windows. There's a lot of work that goes into it. The blueprint laid out in the Word of God is complete. It covers every part of how best to construct your life, how to best construct His kingdom, and it must be studied in totality, or not at all. After we study, then our feet have to hit the road, and we have to do we have to do. After we study, we must do what we have learned. It's not enough to just know all about how to build a house. Right? I know everything about how to build a house. But you never actually start sawing and hammering and building, then it doesn't do any good. 
then it doesn't matter. In James chapter 1, verse 22, James writes, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. There are people in this world who are far more gifted and intelligent and knowledgeable than I could ever dream of being, and they can quote the Bible backwards and forwards, and God bless those people. But they choose not to actually do any of it. And so what good does it do? There are Bible scholars out there who are agnostic. They just chose not to follow any of it, but they know it really well. They know it really well. Knowledge is useless without action. It doesn't matter how much you know if you never act on it. You can know that fire is dangerous, right? Fire is dangerous. You can know that playing with matches and gasoline and fireworks is a bad idea. Kids, don't do it. Matches are bad. Don't play with fireworks. But if you go out and you light up a bucket of gasoline just for fun... And all that knowledge was useless. Please do not light a bucket full of gasoline because that will not end well for you, I promise. Okay. How often do we know the right thing to do? How often do I know the right thing to do? Because I've already read about it. I know it. I know the right thing to do. But I just choose to do otherwise. Right? We do that all the time. Right? It's no different than the kid who knows stealing is wrong, yet still sees candy in the store and steals it. We know what to do, yet we just choose to do otherwise. How often do we know what our God requires of us and then just ignore his will? How often are we confronted with the powerful, immovable, irresistible word of God and tell ourselves, that's not convenient for my time, or my place, or my generation. This is hard to hear. This is hard for me to say. But when the God of gods breathed forth his unyielding word, he did not take our convenience into account. Because that's not what it's about. God didn't breathe forth his word so that we could have convenient, happy lives. But he did it for our good. It's for our good. You'd be the most popular parent in the world, and your children would be so happy if you did nothing but fed them candy. Candy and ice cream every day! Woo! Best dad ever! Right? That's not good for them. No, a good parent sits down with their kids and says, you're eating your vegetables. I don't care if you don't like them. They're good for you. You're eating them. It's for our good. It's for our good. His word is final and absolute, and it's up to us to study it and then to do it. To do it. Once we get that far, the final thing that we need to do is we need to teach, just like Ezra did. We need to teach. Those other two steps are more or less all about you. Right? You're studying the word, and you're trying your best to do it. But then you need to start sharing. Sharing that word with the people around you. You need to teach what you've learned. And I'm a high school teacher, and so I've experienced this many, many times. And I don't know why your brain works this way, but it just does. The human brain is weird. And this is, it just works this way. You will never understand anything more and you will never grasp a concept better, and you will never remember something more vividly than when you try to explain it to someone else. It's just the way the brain works. God just designed us that way. And we could read a whole lot into that. Maybe he designed us that way because he knew that it would never get drilled down into our life until we started sharing it with other people, which is the point of the church. It is a profoundly humbling experience to sit down and be forced to explain to someone something only to realize about halfway through, uh, maybe I don't really know what's going on. Right? We've all lived through this, right? Right? Standing next to a little kid, why is the sky blue? Well, you see, child, it's because... Uh, 
Jesus made it that way. <laughs> it's a cop-out answer, and we all know it. It doesn't work forever. Eventually, they start asking more questions. Right? Eventually, you have to start Googling stuff. There are a few things healthier than your walk with, to your walk with God than to get together with someone who's weak in their faith and discuss and explain and share and grapple with the word of God. God commanded the people of Israel to have that kind of relationship with the word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children. You shall teach them, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Our lives must be saturated with the word of God. It's not enough to just know and to do for ourselves. We need to teach. We need to share the word with those around us. When was the last time we sat around the dinner table and taught the word of God to our family? Shared with them the goodness of God. Made it clear that this house, this family, is founded firmly and surely on the word of God. And that all we have is because he's so, so good to us. I'm going to invite our musicians up. I am so thankful to live in a very privileged age. The Word of God is on the shelves of every bookstore. It's everywhere. It's on every phone in our pockets. And I counted, and this almost seems silly after I did it, I counted, I own seven Bibles, right? It's everywhere. I own seven Bibles. Why do I need seven Bibles? I have them. No, that's just printed Bibles. That's not all the online resources every single one of us have at our disposal constantly. But all of those resources don't matter if I fail to study and do and teach the Word of God. But, but I am so thankful that today is a new day. I'll tell you, I have failed to study and do and teach the Word of God more often than I care to admit. Right? It's a challenge to all of us. But I'm thankful that it's not too late. That although I constantly fail, He is faithful and His Word is is unchanging. I'm thankful that we can depend and stand firm on the foundation of his word every single day. Jesus said in Matthew 24, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 40, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The blueprints for our lives, our church, our community, our whole world, are waiting in the eternal words of an ever-patient God. Just waiting right there. We just need to make a commitment today. A commitment that we won't take his word for granted. Commitment that he will, we will study his word. Not because that's what Christians are supposed to do. Not because the preacher says that's what we have to do. We need to study his word because he loved us enough to share it with us. If you could stand with me. He loved us enough to share his words with us. 
Jesus loves you enough that he doesn't want you to build your life on sand. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to see you fail. Jesus doesn't want your life to fall into ruin. Jesus doesn't want his church to crumble. This church to crumble. Jesus doesn't want this city to be lost. And he gave us everything we need to discover salvation. Everything we need to build a life, a family, a church. But we do need to take those steps. They're so simple. It seems like it's a no-brainer. Easy to understand, but it's hard to actually take them and do them every day. Studying and doing and teaching this beautiful word. Let's take a few minutes and make that commitment now. Every eye closed, every head bowed. If you are home and you're watching online, take a minute with us. Bow your head, close your eyes, stand in your living room, wherever you are. Let's thank God. Thank God for this word, this word that doesn't change, this word that was given to us so that we could follow its blueprints. And let's commit anew to making his word our foundation. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your word, Jesus. I thank you that your word is unfailing. I thank you, Jesus, for giving to us your word. That any time we need to in this privileged age, we can open your word. We can open the Bible and know what it says and study it and read it and hear your eternal words echoing into our generation, into our time. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for them. Lord Jesus, I'm committing today, right now, this moment, to making your word the foundation of my life so that every day I can dig into it and study it and understand what it says. That you'll give me the courage and the strength to do it, to do all of it, not ignoring the parts that seem difficult or inconvenient, but to do all of it. And then, Lord God, give me courage. Give me courage to share this word with those around me. Share this word around me with words of love, with words of encouragement, to show everyone around me the love and the peace I've found in my Jesus. Let's lift his name. Let's praise him right now. Lord God, I thank you. I love you. I praise you. You are so good and you are so holy and so patient with us. Thank you, Jesus.